Well, hello everybody and welcome to Atlanta Live. We're so excited that you're joining us on this program. It's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful program. We're so excited. And I just want you to know that tonight's all about you. We just want to, we want you to sit back, relax, and just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you what you need to hear tonight because I believe that's what he wants to do. And so I just want you to relax and, you know, maybe you're scrolling through the dial and, and all of a sudden you've come across our program. Well, we want you to know that tonight is your night. So just leave, hit the, just leave the channel or the remote alone and just sit back and relax and listen to what God wants to say to you. We have some wonderful guests that's going to be with us, some wonderful musical talent. And so you're going to have a wonderful time with us. So we want you to, to stay tuned uh, in heart and mind. And so as we go forward now, I want to ask you again, open up your heart and ask the Lord, what is it that you would want me to hear tonight? And it's amazing. And so in just a few moments, we're going to begin going to music and we're going to have this special family that's going to be singing. Matter of fact, Deborah Perry and Jaden Call are going to be singing now, I'll Never Get Over. Come on, let's worship with them. I am so happy to tell you today about the most wonderful night when I walk from the darkness of sin and despair and gave my heart to Christ. I'll never get over the night I got over my sin and knelt at the cross. The shackles and chains that had bound me so long in an instant came loose and fell off. Now it's a new day walking up the King's Highway. Thank God I'm no longer lost. I'll never get over the night I got over my sin and knelt at the cross. Since I traded my sin for His grace When I knelt at the altar And came up a shouting Hallelujah, thank God I say I'll never get over the night I got over my sin And knelt at the cross The shackles and chains that had bound me so and fell off. Now it's a new day walking up the King's Highway. Thank God I'm no longer lost. I'll never get over the night I got over my sin and knelt at the cross. Now it's a new day walking up the King's Highway. Thank God I'm no longer Wow, praise God. I'll never get over the night I got over. Isn't that amazing, everybody? What a beautiful, beautiful voice those our wonderful singers have. Well, tonight I'm so honored to introduce you our very first guest. He's a personal friend of mine. His name is 
Raw Waltower. Raul, thank you so much for being on Atlanta Live tonight. Pastor Jeff, thank you for having me. It's an honor for me to be here sitting in these chairs with you today. Wow. Well, Raul, tell us about, uh, about you. Tell us a little bit about Raul Waltower. Sure. Uh, I'll start with uh, my upbringing. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, I went to school in Gainesville, Florida, and I was there uh, at the University of Florida attending school. Uh, I was an, originally an engineering major. Chemistry said change your major, so I obeyed and went into computer science and landed here in Georgia, in the Atlanta area uh, in that time. And uh, a few years after college, I uh, met my beautiful wife. We will be 30 years this upcoming July. Wow, well, congratulations. Amen. So I want to give a shout out to my wife, Shirley. Thank God for that woman of God. And through her, God has blessed us with four beautiful daughters as well. And uh, right now, pastoring, 11th, 11th year of pastoring of True Gospel Christian Church. Wow. Now, tell us about your church and where it's located. Yeah, we're located in the Henry County area. Right now, we're worshiping at uh, uh, Lester Mill mm -hmm. off of Lester Mill Road, 200 Lester Mill Road in Locust Grove. Mm -hmm. And a wonderful group of people that love God, got a heart for God. And uh, what our motto is, 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 is to make sure that we give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Wow. Well, Roll, I know that uh, we've been talking as friends uh, uh, for a last little while and and just tell us what God has been speaking to you. Uh, I know I know what you've been saying to me, but I want you to be able to tell the world about what God has been speaking to you lately. I really appreciate that. And this is one of the passions that I have, Jeff. And that is the fact that I want to be a part of the group or the individuals that would answer Jesus's one only unanswered prayer. Mm. The unanswered prayer of Jesus can be found in John 17 where he was praying to his father and he said, Father, make them one as you and I are one. Mm. And so we, of all of the prayers that Jesus ever prayed to his father, he even told people, he said, Father, I pray this to you so that they can know that you hear me. Right. But the one outstanding prayer is oneness. So mm. just a heart and a passion to see the body of Christ come together as one. And so that's where my heart is. That's where the passion is. And that's where God is driving us at this moment. Mm. So when you, when you talk about becoming one, and you talk about the unanswered prayer of the Lord in John 17. Raul, tell us a little bit more about that. Like, what is it that you hope to see happen? When you say uh, becoming one, what, what do you hope to see? What I hope, Jeff, what I'm looking for, and if I can take a little latitude here to yes. reference the scripture, a very, yes. very familiar scripture, which, which you all know, Psalm 133, mm -hmm. behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Mm -hmm. Then the Bible goes on and talks about that unity as a descri description as to how the oil was poured on Aaron, the priest, and flowed through his beard and his garments. And then it gives a description of how that oil was like dew from Mount Hermon to Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. And then he ends with this, there I will command a blessing. Now to understand that scripture, we got to back up just a moment because mm -hmm. that scripture is letting us know, it says how good and pleasant. The word good is translated meaning uh, profitable and uh, prosperous. Mm -hmm. Pleasant is translated pleasurable. So when there is unity, God says you can have your cake and eat it too. Oh, wow. Not too many things in, world, in the world that's pleasurable and good for you right. at the same time. Mm -hmm. But according to the word of God, unity is. And so this oneness that, we're, that God is desiring and seeing is to see the body of Christ connected as one, to be that one body of Christ, not a church, but the church. Yep. And so that's what he's calling together right now. Wow. And, you know, as, of course, as you and I have talked because we're friends and and we're both in the same community and, uh, you know, you're on the south side of Henry County, the southern end of it. I'm on the northern end yes. of Henry County. And it's just amazing how God has put in our hearts, your heart, my heart, and several other pastors in our community about this spirit of unity and, and this oneness. Let me ask you something. How do you think that we can accomplish this oneness? What, what do you think that, that, like, what is it that we could begin to do? Because, you know, everybody talks about, oh, we need to come together. We need to come together. What do you, what do you think that it is that will bring us together? I think what would, what would do it in us coming together 
is for us to, number one, to begin to know that we are all members of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been disjointed. Yeah. And by, because we've been disjointed, we're not functioning as a one cohesive body. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ died for the church, not for part of the church, not yeah. just for the foot, not just for the hand, but it's all of us that make up this body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So I believe one of the first things we can do and this may sound a little bit off the wall to a degree, but I think we have to lay down our egos as pastors. Amen. One Amen. of the things I believe is that pastors somewhat can be territorial. Yep. My members, my church. Right. It's God's church. It's Amen. Jesus' is Christ's church. He's the one that died for it. And so I believe when we can learn to come to lay down our logos and pick up the logos. Oh, wow. Jesus Christ being the logos. Mm -hmm. And so if we can have that mindset to come together to, as one. If I were to ask many pastors and my, several pastors will be watching us tonight, do you have a back to school rally? Mm -hmm. They will probably raise their hand. Do you do outreach? We'll probably raise their hands. Mm -hmm. What would happen is five, six, 10, 11 churches came together to do that together. Mm -hmm. I want to share this story with you. I'm not going to go in details with it, but I was watching a news clip recently and some disturbances was taking place in Chicago. And mm -hmm. this one person made this statement as someone was saying, we believe that the faith-based community is helping us to turn the sentiment mm -hmm. within the community. This one person stood up and said, I disagree with that because we have not listened to the faith-based community since Dr. Martin Luther King. Wow. That registered a chord in me wow. that the church, we have lost influence with the public and with the culture. Mm -hmm. We're never, we're not invited to the table anymore, mm -hmm. except every two to four years when it's time to vote. Oh, that's exactly right. Wow. You know, it's amazing how that, and, and that's exactly what, the opposite of what Jesus said we're doing as a church. He said, he said, you know, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Yes. He said, when you do that, then the world is going to know that you're my disciples indeed because you love one another. That's right. And it's, it's that love that people see within the body of Christ, which would draw them to the body of Christ. John 17, verse 21, that last part when Jesus says, Father, make them one as you and I are one. The reason why he wants us to be one, because it, it, that scripture concludes with this, so that they, the world, not the body of Christ, but so that the world would know that you sent me. Mm -hmm. So when the church operates together as one, we prove to the world that Jesus, in fact, was the Son of God. Amen. What greater testimony can we give? If I may, again, take a little bit of latitude, yes, because as yes. you know, this is a passion of body, just as, as it is yours as well. Let me break down Psalm 133 for a moment. Psalm 133 is known as an accent son, mm -hmm. uh, psalm. They call it the Song of Degrees. If you have a superscript in your Bible, it probably reads Song of Degrees mm -hmm. or Accent Psalm. There are 15 songs of degrees, Psalm 120 through Psalm Psalm 134 are known as this, and Psalm 133 is one of those psalms. The reason why they call it Song of Degrees or Accent song, Psalms is because in the Old Testament, God commanded Israel three times a year, they all were to gather together mm -hmm. and come to Jerusalem to worship. That was on Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. And so what they were doing is as they ascended, ascent, ascended towards the place of worship, the priests would begin to lead the congregation in reading these psalms. They would start with Psalm 120, read 121 in unison, mm -hmm. and they make their way all the way to Psalm 134. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about that, Jeff, is this here, is that at the time when David writes this psalm, he is writing this psalm during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And he is seeing all of Israel coming together, mm. dis ascending towards the place of worship to come and worship the Lord. Mm. By the time Solomon, his son, comes along and builds the temple, uh, the temple steps had 15 steps. Mm -hmm. I just said earlier there were 15 psalms mm -hmm. of degrees. Yes, you did. The priests would start on step one and they would read or sing 120. They would go to step two wow. and read or read or sing 121 until they reach the 15th step. Wow. Now, here's, here's what's really interesting. 15 steps, 15 psalms. The Bible tells us when, G, when God says that, that in the place of unity, there I will command the blessing. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask the question, where is there? There is unity. And the blessing that he commands is his presence. Mm -hmm. Where two or three are gathered together, what? In my name, what happens? 
he's in the midst. Right. On the day of Pentecost, they gathered in the upper room. What happens? His Holy Spirit is poured out. Mm -hmm. Peter goes to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius gathers his entire family and friends to hear Peter speak. They were gathered together in unison, and what happened? The Holy Spirit was poured out. Mm -hmm. So as they're marching, they're making their ascent up these steps, and they get to the 15th step. The gematria, the gematria is a very simple thing. If you take the letters in your name and add them up numerically, you come up with a numeric value. My name is Rawl, R-A-L. The 18th letter is R. The first letter is A. The L being the 12th letter, letter my gematria would be 31. Mm -hmm. Guess what gematria in Hebrew represents 15? Yah. Wow. which is the, uh, the, the short name of God. Mm -hmm. So the more brethren and sisters walk together in unison, they reach the presence of God. Wow. So I believe as we come together within our communities as churches and pastors, we're going to usher in the presence of God within our community because the blessing and the promise is, I'll command the blessing to be wherever I see unity and the blessing is my presence. Right, wow. Wow, what a great word, Raul, what a great word. Yes. Well, I'm so thankful for you. you. What we're discovering in our community is that churches never come together until pastors do. Yes. And pastors, you know, the thing, pastors try to, try to come together for events and that doesn't work either. Because we go to the event and we go half-heartedly because we feel obligated and our heart's not there. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm finding out is that when you and I and other pastors in our community come together because we want to and we desire to be with each other and to encourage each other to call or to pray for each yes. other, that changes everything. And now, you know, you and I are coming together not because we have to, but because we want to, because we love each other. Correct. And so maybe speak into that a moment. Yeah, another great thing. And I would while we are on this program, I want to commend you for the great work that you are doing. And you are being such a role model for me. Uh, you, 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 you call pastors, you text pastors. I get a text from you every week saying, I prayed for you and this is how I prayed for you. That's bringing unity together. That's taking us more just from a casual acquaintance to building a brotherhood amongst ourselves. So to, to answer your question and respond to what you said, I believe that's how it happens is mm -hmm. when we come together as one, when we're, when we're building with relationship, when we're spending time together, that is how God does that. Then the other thing I believe is that I believe that every church and pastor can agree on one thing, and that's prayer. Amen. So we can definitely come together in prayer to pray and to allow God to work in and through us. Amen. And I definitely, that, that uh, conversation thought of prayer is absolutely, I think, the greatest thing that we can do together because I don't know about you, Raul, you may want to answer this, but, but prayer is... Um, is the best thing that I could ever do for you and that you could ever do for me. Mm -hmm. And the second best thing is that you could let me know you prayed for yes. me. And the second best thing I could do for you is let you know that I prayed for you. Mm -hmm. And so it's just one, th it's one thing when a person prays and we don't know it, but when we know that they prayed, it changes things. Yes. And so, uh, Ron, we have about uh, five minutes left here. And there's something that you're doing in our community that I'm so proud of you for. And I'm so thankful to God for what you're doing, Amen. how you bring our community together. And so why don't you tell us that of the remainder of the time that we have, let's talk about what you're doing because there may be people that's watching in our area that want to join us or there may be people in other parts of the country or world that want to do it where they are. So tell us about it. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So basically what we're doing is rallying churches together and pastors together to come on a single day, May 2nd, on a Thursday at 7 p.m. to pray. And we're going to gather all of the people at the halls. And what I mean by the halls, the city halls of the areas in which you're in. Wow. So bring all at the hall, okay? Oh, wow, I love it, I love it, yes. Uh, I got that idea from someone. So. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> but, uh, it was, and so by doing this here, we, we, we have a website. So if anyone's watching, you're interested, if you wanna send this to your pastor, please go to praytogether.life, praytogether.life, and you can register, uh, come and find out what we're doing. And you don't have to do anything other than go to the congregation, tell your friends, send 
send it to Christian business owners and allow them to register and, and be there at your city hall in your location, and we're just going to come and we're going to pray. Right. There's not going to be any superstar preachers. There's not going to be anyone that's taking over. Now, we want the big names to be there, uh -huh. but no one is in control of this. When you go to that website, praytogether.life, you will not see a church name on that website mm -hmm. because we're not trying to promote a church. We're trying right. to promote the body of Christ. Amen. And so the only time you'll see a name is when you register, we put your name and your church name in the registry so people can see who's coming. Wow. But that's, that's, that's how we're doing this. And so I believe that through this oneness of individuals gathering together to share prayers, to share love, and to, again, when we do this in unity, we're going to prove to the world that's driving by, Jesus was definitely sent by God because these people are praying together. Amen. And you know what I just love what you just said is that, hey, I love, we're going to gather at the hall, right? I love that part. We're going to gather at the hall, city hall. And the great thing is that we're not doing anything political. No. And that you just, you know, your thing is that no politics, no media, we're going there to pray. And that means that ever how you decide to pray, pray. Yes. It's on the, and that is on the National Day of Prayer as well, right? It is. It is on the same day what the National Day of Prayer is and, uh, and what God is leading us to do within our community and abroad is that when you go and register at Pray uh, together dot life. Uh, there's a link there. We have cities that's already there from individuals that have registered for those cities. So if you go there, senior pastor, individual, church member, and you don't see your city there, just click on a link to send us an email and we will make sure that your city gets registered and we'll put your city hall on that website as well. Wow. So we have about a minute left, uh, Rolf. So tell us about that, I want you to say that website again very slowly because it's very good. It, I, hope, I hope all of you will go check that website out. It's amazing. Uh, say it again. What's the direction? Yes, it's praytogether.life. Praytogether.life. Pray awesome. And in this last minute that we have, Jeff, uh, this is the center focus in this. The latter part of that Psalm 133 where the word says that it was like the oil that was poured on Aaron's heads to his beard and went to his skirts. The word skirts, that's in the, out, that's in the extremities of his garments. Mm -hmm. Another word, we would say him. The him comes from frayed, gathering up frayed pieces and, and, and strings on, a, in, on the end of a garment and sewing them together to make them one. Wow. You wow. cannot get a him unless it's all sewed together. Amen. Well, well, uh, Raul, I want to say thank you so much. Well, we're going to go to music now. We have Deborah Perry and Jaden's Call, and they're singing God Sees Your Storm. No matter what you may be going through in this life, God sees your storm from the other side. It may look dreary, but He sees it. Listen. No one ever said life would be easy and tragedy can come at any turn but what seems to be a hurricane from this side of the clouds he knows it's just another chance for mercy to rain down God sees your storm, how it's going to pass. The skies are growing dark, the sun will shine at last. God sees your storm from the other side. So hold on through the rain and do not be God sees your storm. There is comfort in His very presence. There is shelter underneath His wings. So when my heart is pounding fast from trials as they roll in, I just speak the name above all names and run to Him again.
everybody. I hope that you're enjoying this wonderful uh, music team that we have, Deborah Perry and Jaden's Call. What a beautiful song. God sees uh, your storm, and He sees the other side of it. Well, again, I hope that you're enjoying. Man, what a wonderful uh, uh, guest we just had with uh, Raw Wall Tower. And tonight, I'm so honored because a very, very special person in my life is here on the set with me tonight, and I'd like to introduce the world to Miss Belinda Lane. Miss Belinda, it's so good to see you. Thank you. It's good to be here, and what an honor. I do appreciate it. Well, Miss Belinda, I got to tell everybody that you're one of the best prayer warriors in my <laughs> life, in my church, and and uh, we're so excited because your story. Uh, it's been amazing as we have as you have shared your story with me, and you've also placed it in a book, and we'll be putting that up. It's called Standing on the Edge of Your Tomorrow, and this book you've written, it's just amazing to me how, that, uh, how your story has been. So why don't you just begin to tell us a little bit about your journey? Well, my father was a pastor, uh -huh. and so by the time I was 10, we had lived in four different states. Wow. So we were like military kids. Yeah. But he would get a church in one state and then we would move on. We finally ended up on my 10th birthday in Baltimore, Maryland. So that's where I really grew up and went to school uh, there. Life probably began for me at 18. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd probably say 13, because at 13, that was when I had made a decision that um, I was going to run away. Mm. <laughs> And that was my first encounter with angels. Mm, tell us about that. Well, things had happened in the house, and I just like, okay, I can't do this anymore. So I always say you have to probably Google this, but I tied a sheet to a radiator. <laughs> wow, like a radiator yes, heater. Yes, heater, uh -huh. and climbed out of my um, window, second floor window. And when I got to the end of the alley, it's like a light bulb went on to say, okay, your father's a pastor. Police is going to come for you. You are going to get killed when mm -hmm. you get home. Yeah. So what I did was go across the street 
but I noticed I had my key around my neck. Now, I know I did not put my key around my neck. Uh -huh. Okay. So I had my door key around my neck, so I sat across the street until I saw the lights go out in my parents' bedroom, and I sat there until I figured they were asleep, and I snuck back in the house. Well, that's also the time that I made a decision that at 18, I was going to leave home on the day I turned 18. And on the day I turned 18, I did leave home. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, now tell us, I know that in your story that you share that maybe home life was not the best in your home. Right. It, it wasn't. I don't know if it was the pressure or what, but when you are past this kid, and also I say, say even for pastor wives, who do you go to? Mm. Who do you talk to? Right. So there was no one for me to talk to. And being the oldest, I was the one that got the, the beatings and, you know, it was just, I couldn't take it anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I just made a decision. I, I just don't want to live like this. Mm -hmm. And so anything I think that was set my father off, I was the one that was the one that got, like I say, got the beatings, got the smack, you know, hitting. So I was like, no, I don't think I need to live like this. Mm -hmm. Tell us, tell us a little bit because there's some people that are watching tonight that are pastor's kids. Yeah. And, and maybe they've been down that road a little bit. So tell us about the pressure of that. What, what made that such a, a high pressure uh, family the, environment? The high pressure is your parents want you to live one way. Mm -hmm. The church wants you to live one way. Mm. So by the time we were 18, we were, we were, you hear the saying that the pastor's children are the worst children. Mm -hmm. That's not true. We're confused mm -hmm. <laughs> because we've had to live the way the church wants us to. We've had to live the way our parents want us to. We don't know who we are. Mm. And it's so funny because in the church, if a young lady gets pregnant, you see the mothers of the church, a lot of times they give her a baby shower and everything. But if the pastor's daughter gets pregnant, oh, it's a shame. Everybody turns away. Wow. You know, it's the talk, it's the gossip. You know, so you just walk around. I did not get pregnant uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, in the church, yeah. but I have watched how other pastors' daughters have been, you know, treated yes. by the members. And sometimes the members can be the harshest things mm -hmm. because I literally would have um, members come up to me and tell me, oh, I can make you get a beating. Now, these are the adults right, talking, to, yeah. talking to a child. And when I got home, and it's like, ah, when I heard my father knock on the door, on my bedroom door, and he would say, um, I need you to come with me. And when I would go to his room and open the door, and I see a belt laying on the bed. Mm. So I knew somebody had done lied on me. Somebody had done told something on me. And um, I suffered the consequences. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. I can remember my daughter sharing some of those stories of like when she was even in school that, uh, you know, she couldn't be a typical teenager because right. even the teachers would say, well, I would expect more out of you because yes. you're a pastor's ch mm -hmm. child or whatever. You know, you, you don't represent that very well. Should a pastor's daughter be doing that? And it was something minor, just yeah. being a teenager or, or nothing bad. So, so your journey went from 18, you left home, well, take us a little bit more because I read some of this in your book and I'm telling you, <laughs> listen, you need to get this book before nothing else for the first chapter is so amazing. So, uh, so uh, Belinda, begin well, to tell us a little bit about that. It was never my intent to leave church because church was all I knew. Yes. And when you're taught from the time that you can understand it, you're going to go to hell uh -huh. if you are not. Well, I want to say serving God because it was more so, I would say we were taught religion versus relationship. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came, he taught relationship. Yes. I and my father are one. You know, everything he said, it was of, of the father. Yes. But in the churches that I came up in, it was, re it was religion. Mm -hmm. So when I finally left, I went to join another church and they told me, well, I can't let you join my church because my father had a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, uh, why not? They say, because my, your father said, if I let you join my church, he'll break fellowship with us. Mm. So that's how I ended out of the church. Mm. So when I went out there, I didn't know anything about clubbing, drinking or anything. Right. So with some of my coworkers, we went to this club and that's when the real journey began. Yes. You know, we went to this club. I didn't even know what to order. I ordered what she ordered. 
one of the things I knew that I was looking for in life was to feel safe. Yes. I never, ever, as a child, felt safe. So when we got there to the club and I saw this guy come in, and he had all these people around him and all these women, which he was a pimp, I found out, uh -huh. you know. And I was like, okay. So then after a while, this lady came in and all of the women with him, they just kind of scattered. So I asked the waiter, I said, well, who is this lady? He said, well, that's his, that's his real woman. He said, she don't mind him, you know, having, you know, the, cause he was a pimp. She don't yeah. mind him having the women because she gets what she want. And I was like, well, that is really silly. But then he said one key thing, he said, but she's safe, and she knows she can go anywhere, and she don't have to look over her back or worry about anything. Wow. And I realized at that point I wasn't looking for love because I didn't even know what love was. Mm -hmm. I was looking to be safe. Wow. So I ended up, um, like I would say in my book, with my, everybody that knew me on their knees praying for my wretched soul yeah. because I ended up with a guy that was a gangster, and... Uh, it was never my intent to go in that direction, but what I knew was I was safe. And neither one of us knew what love was. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I tell a lot of women, because my son will always say this to me. He say, Mom, why is it that women always look for the thugs? <laughs> That's, right. what he That's a great he question. Say, he say, but when they get them, then they try to make them like me, you know, mm -hmm. the nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I say, basically, it's because they know that the thug will fight. Mm -hmm. They don't know if you will fight. Mm. And women are looking for safety, but what they don't know is when they try to leave that thug, if he don't want them to leave, she ain't going nowhere. Mm. And that's what happened with me. Actually, my, the person that I was with was getting ready, he was already a gangster. Mm. He was getting ready to join the mafia. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one of the things I knew about the mafia was that you're going to do what they say. And if you don't, they're going to get the closest thing to you, That's which right. was me. Right. I said, because they still need you to do what they said. So they, they were coming into our city, coming into Baltimore, and I was like, I can't do this. I got to get out of this. So what I did was, and I told him, I said, I'm leaving. And he was like, so we had come in from a club this night with another couple that was in the, we were in the back seat. When I got out of the door, when I got out, I said, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I closed the door and I heard the door open again. So now, up to this day, I have my keys in my hand before, before, I, get to, before I get out of my car. Right. Because when I heard the door close, I knew he was coming behind me. When I opened the door, we hit the floor and we fought. I mean, I was fighting for my life, he was fighting for his life. Mm -hmm. But his life was to keep me in his life. Wow. My fight was to get me out. Mm. So to make a long story short, the, the thing, the next morning, and I think he knocked me out because when I woke up, came to the next morning, it was daylight. That's how fierce the fight was. Mm -hmm. And I had always said before I left home, I would never, ever let another man hit me. Mm. Never. Mm -hmm. I say, I did it all through my childhood. I couldn't do nothing about right. it. So I, I had a neighborhood friend. Well, he was a neighborhood friend, a neighborhood gangster. Uh -huh. you, know, you know, the guys that stand on the corner, not really gangsters, but thugs. Right. And he got me a gun, and I went looking for him. And by the time I went to a couple of places, they knew that I was looking at my face, that it was not I was looking for him for a good reason. Mm -hmm. He actually ended up leaving the state for a while. But, he, but I found out later he left because it was going to end up either he was going to have to kill me or his boys were going to know that, they, that I'm looking for him. Mm -hmm. He was scared that one of them was going to try to kill me. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really, really want me dead. Mm -hmm. you know? So... At that point, um, I just had to, I had to let it go. Wow. I remember reading um, one part of your story that where I actually had a gun to your head one yep. time. Yeah, I had said... a gun and to my head and, and made the statement. I'm sitting there and I'm talking like, you know, because a couple of times I tried to get out of the yeah. relationship and I'm sitting there and I'm saying, look, I can't do this. And he left the room, came back in, and he said, I can't let you go. And I was like... And then I felt this cold, because I'm looking out the window, and I right. felt this cold against my forehead and turned around, and he had this gun. Tears was flowing. He's shaking the gun, and he's crying, and I'm like, I love you. And he said, I can't let you go. I said, I love you. He said, and that's all I ever want to hear from you. Mm. Yeah. Wow. That is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, 
we have about five minutes left here, and everybody's captivated. We're all, I keep climbing on the edge of my seat here, like the, your story is so amazing. But this book is amazing as well, Standing on the Edge of Your Tomorrow. Tell us a little bit more about your book. What, what can the people discover or, or find out about themselves? Or why did you write it, and what's within it? We got about five minutes, so would you just share that with us? One of the things my publisher said, she said, you speak for people that can't speak for themselves. Mm. Um, my next story in there is Homeless John, and I talk about a guy that, um, why he was on the street, what, what brought him to be homeless, mm -hmm. which I do hope one day to become a movie. Mm -hmm. And then I have a story in there, um, a moment in reality about a homeless woman and how her children was taken from her because she was sleeping in the park. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of my stories, I may have a setting, and I create the story itself, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then I have stories in there on spiritual warfare, mm -hmm. you know, angelic beings. Because like I say, I truly believe, because when I was 15, I tried to take my life. Mm -hmm. And I remember on the third floor, and I was in a window, and I went to throw my leg. I threw one leg out the window, and I remember looking up saying, oh, an angel. And I don't know what made me say it, but I know that when I came to, I was laying across my bed. Mm. So, you know, so I, 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 I do know. My book is a book of short stories because mm -hmm. I wanted, you know, we like the microwave age now. So yeah. I wanted people to be able to just, just be able to read stories. I, uh, again, like I say, I have stories on domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I've worked in a psychiatric hospital as a, a technician for eight years. So just hearing other people's stories, I created a story around that. So, yeah. I, I remember reading some of those stories and which was amazing, reading it in the third person and, mm -hmm. and hearing that person, you know, you, you so well brought those people alive that were there. And yeah. of course, how the guy would go to the, uh, the soup kitchen, you know, and, yeah. and from the bridge and so forth. Yeah. So it was very, very intriguing to me. So what is your hope that people will get out of reading this book? My hope is they will know God's unconditional love. Mm. And that's what I had to find out. I didn't know about, literally, I was in my probably 30s before I understood God's unconditional love. Mm. He loves me. There's no condition. There's nothing I can do, nothing I can say. He just loves me for God so loved the world mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. You know, so he wants us to know. We listen to people. I've heard people say, well, as soon as I get myself together, you know, as soon as I, you know, straighten my life, you can't straighten your life out. You can't get Amen. yourself together. It's going to take God. You know, I was a chain smoker when I was out there. I was smoking two to two and a half pack of cigarettes a day, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So I was a chain. When I, the moment I came back to the Lord, Instantly, I just, he just took it. Wow. He just took it. I didn't have to try to wean myself off it. He just took it, mm. you know. So it, it's, I just want people to know that God loves them and stop letting pe people have stolen so many people's lives from them. Mm -hmm. You know, even the church sometimes say that you got to do this, you got to, they give conditions. Right. There is no conditions right. with God. Amen. He loves us. Well, listen, we have about a minute and a half left. What would you say to that person who is going through a situation like you went through when, you know, maybe, so we're talking, basically we would have said you was in sex trafficking back then, you know, <laughs> I mean, you would have been one of those people who would have been labeled, hey, she mm -hmm. was caught up in it. In one minute, would you just tell us, what would you say to that person that's caught up in that situation right now? To take your life back. The thing, the reason why so many people are out there is because people have stolen their, their life. Mm -hmm. You know, before they could even understand who they were, a lot of people are labeled, they are under the label of their abuser, under the label of childhood. You have to let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, again, God is there. And, and, and I have to, that's what I want to preach. I want people to know God does love us. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can't do it ourselves. We have to let him do it. Wow. Well, I love what you said about, hey, you don't get good before you get God. You get yeah. God and then you get good. Yeah. Well, Belinda, thank you so much. Again, the book is Standing on the Edge of Tomorrow. I hope that you will pick up a copy of this and you can uh, go to her website that's been on the screen or contact the station for that. Well, we're going now to Deborah Perry and Jaden's Call, and they're singing at the end of every prayer, everybody.
uplifted song that Brother Waylon Bays over here wrote a song entitled At the End of Every Prayer. Listen. Life can hit you like a hurricane. You're lost within the wind and driving rain. Oh, but in your darkest moments, that brings you to your knees. You'll find a place where grace and sorrow meet. Every broken heart can fall into the arms of love. Everyone who's lost can come, cause Jesus is enough. Every cry for mercy finds that God's already there at the end of every prayer. Ooh. So bring the questions weighing on your mind. asking why you see our Lord is always faithful to all who will believe just call upon his name and you will see that every broken heart can fall into the arms of love everyone who's lost can come Jesus is enough. Every cry for mercy finds that God's already there at the end of every breath. Oh, 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 Even when your heart is torn, you may go. of love everyone who's lost can come cause Jesus is enough every broken heart can fall into the arms of love everyone who's lost can come cause Jesus is enough every cry for mercy finds that God's already Wow, I can definitely say that God is there on at the end of every prayer. And I hope that I hope that you believe that. I hope that you know tonight that God loves you. You know, we've just had two amazing guests on and you could see the passion in both of their eyes and hear it in their voice is that they know that there's a God that changes things. You know, Pastor Raul Waltower shared with us how that God's unity is so important. Unity in the community, that God, there's only one prayer that Jesus hasn't had the answer to, and that is that we become one. And so our prayer tonight is that, that we would become one. I hope tonight, as a result of this program and hearing his, his testimony and, and the word that he gave us, that you would find somebody and that you would begin to just love them like Jesus loved you. Matter of fact, what I'd like to do is you've just heard Miss Belinda talk about finding God's love. I'd like to talk to you about that just a minute. It's like 
You know, so as a pastor, so many people ask me, what am I to do? I remember as I started talking to you about this, what am I to do, is that I'm reminded of the Atlanta Falcons in 2016. Many of us don't want to remember that day when they were in the Super Bowl and become the sore spot. But the Atlanta Falcons had a 25-point lead on the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl in the third quarter. And something began to happen. And that was that the, the Patriots began to get momentum and they started scoring points. And the Falcons, they, they panicked. And they got away from their game plan. All, everyone that analyzed the game said that the reason they lost that game, that they allowed the Patriots to come back and overcome them and win the game, was because they, they got off their game plan. They strayed from their game plan. And I want to tell you tonight, if you want your life to be on track, then I want to offer you a game plan. And that game plan tonight is simply what Belinda talked about and Raul talked about, and that is the love of God. Listen to what Jesus said in John 13, 34. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Just think about that a moment. It's a commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. You know, I want to love people. I'm sure you do too, but many times I haven't known how to do that. And I've had to ask God to help me. And I've tried to kind of take this passage of Scripture that Jesus said, I want to teach you tonight. And I've tried to say this, I love like Jesus loves me. Why don't you say that right now, wherever you are? I love like Jesus loves me. There's a few things that I want to share with you tonight that I think are going to help you wherever, if you're listening to this live tonight or it's a recording, I want you to know there's three things that I think will help us love like Jesus. The first thing I would tell you is that we need to learn to be patient. I don't know about you, but when I hear that word patient, I remember being a kid in church and I would say, you know, I got to learn patience. And the older people would say, shh. Don't say that. Don't pray for patience. And it freaked me out. I was like, what did I do wrong? Did I say a curse word? Or what did happen? Don't be patient. Don't ask for patience. I say, why? They say, because when you ask for patience, things get worse. Well, let me just tell you, as I read the scripture, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us this. The first thing it says about love, it says, love is patient. In other words, if I don't have patience, I can't have love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. It does not delight in evil, rejoices in truth. It always trusts, always hopes, and always protects. And love never fails. The reason that we can say that is because it started off with love is patience. You know what I've discovered about patience is that patience is almost like bad breath. I only notice it when it comes out of somebody else's mouth when they're being impatient. When I'm being impatient, I don't notice it. And so patience, what is it? It's the ability. What causes impatience? Let me say that. Well, when I'm being impatient, what it simply means is this, is that I want someone to do what I want them to do when I want them to do it. <laughs> Did you hear that? Have you ever done that? I want someone to do what I want them to do it when I want them to do it. And that is being impatient. And so basically when I realize what, what I'm asking, it all boils down to this, being selfish. When I am impatient, I'm really being selfish. I want what I want when I want it, and you need to give it to me. Thank God that he was patient with us. Matter of fact, the Bible says this in 1 Peter. Listen to what he says. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Did you hear that? You know what that means tonight? That God's not looking to get even with you. God's not wanting to get you back. God's not wanting to make you pay. God's wanting you to repent. 
You know what that means, repent? The word repent means to do a 180, to turn. In other words, if I'm going this direction, turn and go back this direction. If sin is this way and God is this way, repentance means I'm going this way and God wants me to go back this way. That's what repentance is. And so to, tonight I would, I would ask you, being that God has been so patient with you, and that's what love is. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Well, I want to ask you, have you repented in a while? Have you turned back to God? I want to let you in on a secret in my life that I learned about three years ago. I've been a pastor of my church for 29 years, but I've learned something all the time, but especially about three years ago. I learned that repentance is doing a 180 and that when I turn, when I turn toward God, I'm turning away from sin. And so every day I want to make that choice. And why is that so important? Because every time that I turn toward sin, I'm turning away from God. So you can't have it both ways. And so we want to learn to be patient with others because God is patient with us. And so tonight, I want to encourage you, wherever you are in your walk, tonight to practice repentance. Why don't you turn? Some of you need to return to God. Some of you have never had a relationship with God, and so you need to turn to Him. But there's some of you that have had a relationship with God, and you started walking the other direction. And you need to return to Him. If I could say anything to you, I would say, please return. Because if you could see and you could hear, you would see that there would be angels all around you that God has put a place there in your path. And you would hear this still small voice speaking, Come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for your soul. Tonight, I want to leave you with this. If you need to return to Christ, that you can have this patience, this love. Or if you need to come to Christ, you never prayed this prayer, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. And it simply says this. I want you to repeat it wherever you are. If you're with someone and you don't want to say it out loud, you don't have to, but I'd encourage you to. It simply says this, Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and dying for my sins. Thank you for giving your life for mine. Jesus, Come into my life. Save me. Forgive me. And help me to do your will. Now say this. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. My friend, if you said that prayer tonight and you meant it, if you've been away from God and you repented, you turned toward God, he heard your prayer and welcome back to the family. If you've been away, if you've not been a child of God at all, but you turned back tonight, I just want to say welcome to God's family. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, everybody. God's favor be on you.